Okay, so <coughs> um, we were talking about the um, safety regulations in the last class. We started with some of the regulations uh, that are adapted by the different navy. We are first of all saw that generally the safety regulations are formulated by the International Maritime Organization, the IMO, which is a, a unit of the United Nations. Now, um, now this code, that is the set of code or the rules that have been uh, developed by the IMO, uh, has then been adapted or modified for their particular purposes for by the different navies, uh, mainly the U.S. Navy. We will discuss here the U.S. Navies, the U.K. Navy, uh, and the German Navy. So these navies, there are some uh, differences in the rules, slight differences. For example, in the formulas for either the wind healing arm or the turning moment, there are slight differences in constants, in the constants in the equations. And uh, uh, these have been adapted for the particular seas to which their ships travel. So first of all, we look at the codes by the IMO. We already uh, developed, we already gave the some of the important rules associated with the IMO codes. Um, that is that the area between, how the area between 0 to 30 degrees, always note that it, most of the uh, rules regarding the stability concepts revolve around the, um, what we call as the statical stability curve. The statical stability curve we have already defined. In fact, it is the, in fact, it is the backbone of this um, stability analysis. The, stabi the whole course on stability, in fact, revolves around this uh, statical stability curve. This is the most important. So, in case the ship does not have a lull, we uh, draw the statical stability curve like this. And the statical stability curve is also known as the writing arm curve or the GZ curve. It is the same thing um, as you know by now, that is GZ is the, uh, which we is defined as GM sin phi is the statical stability curve. So, GZ curve. So, it is a curve between GZ with the writing arm and phi. And uh, we have already seen how uh, the rules exist, um, which state that the area under the statical stability curve should be um, less than, uh, should be greater than 0 0.05, 5 meter radians between 0 to 30, uh, 0 0.03 between 30 to 40, like that we described the rules yesterday. So, these are the basic set of rules around which the stability calculations and stability check is being is usually done in the uh, by this classification societies like the uh, Lloyd's register or um, the uh, American Bureau of Shipping. Now, um, some, some other important, we will also check some of the important rules associated with the different uh, means in general, see in general we see that um, the uh, stability rules for any particular any particular navy, whether it is the US, UK or German navy or Indian navy, the main set of stability rules are those associated with wind healing, as you can see here wind healing, then the turning healing, then passenger and cargo healing, uh, me the meaning of wind is the wind, uh, the wind acts like this, it produces a healing. What are the stability, what is the stability criterion of the ship um, when it is subjected to different ranges of wind? As we will see, some of the, uh, some of the navies in fact classify their ships in according to the, into different categories. That is the navies classify, the, for example, the German navy for instance classify their ships into different categories uh, depending on the type of winds to which the ship is subjected to. They do not classify it. Uh, as the type of ship means they do not separate between let us say a tanker and a cargo ship or between a uh, bulk carrier and a um, passenger carrying vessel, but they divide it in on the into categories on the basis of the winds to which the ship is going to be subjected to when it is on sea. So, you know that the categories of winds can vary from let us say 10 knots uh, in actually 1 knot when is it is a unit of distance uh, unit of uh, velocity one knot is about 0.5414 meter per second so this is what you mean by a knot so we usually winds in meteorology are usually defined in terms of knots of course they can also be measured in meter per second uh, which comes in the mks units 
So, uh, this is what we call as a knot. So, usually we the, the ships are classified on the basis of the winds that they are subjected to starting from about 10 knots which is a very calm, calm ocean um, which you will see in some parts and uh, sub, it goes up to 20, 30, 40, 50 knots, 50 knot winds are possible. We are talking about 25 meter per second winds, they are very strong winds. They are found in some of the regions of Northern Sea, Baltic Ocean, Baltic Sea, etc. So, these areas are subject, these are regions with very strong winds and gusts is another word that is used. Wind, we call it as wind and as a gust, two slightly, two, uh, slightly separate meanings. The meaning is, it is like the difference between a steady force, a constant force acting for a long time on a ship and a sudden impulse. You, you must be familiar with the difference between the two. S by a sudden impulse, we mean, we mean a very strong force or very some force that is acting for a very short time. So, it produces a very strong impulse on the ship or any body. So, that we call it as a gust. So, that means a very strong wind is acting for a very short time. Now, as we have seen, we have, uh, uh, we have um, <coughs> studied the um, course, we have divided the course mainly in terms of uh, two, uh, two topics, means we have uh, approached the stability from two points of view. As you remember, we have approached it from the point of view of static stability and uh, then we approached it from the point of view of dynamic stability. The difference between the two is this. Uh, that is first of all static stability, we talk about a ship in static condition, we, it is not really subjected to very strong impulses, by impulse we mean some sudden, some something sudden acting for a short time, but on the other some sudden transient phenomena we call as steady state and unsteady state. For example, a steady state by mean, by the means of a steady state we mean a situation where it is steady as a function of time, means it is not really a function of time, it is constant. And in the case of a transient state or an unsteady state, we talk about a situation that is changing with time. It can be very rapidly, it can be very slow, moderate, continuous change. Now, these two categories of uh, studies we'll, we have been incorporating into this, we have done it in this course and I have already in some of the lectures, I have somewhere I have mentioned that um, uh, the, the, I have mentioned to you the importance of dynamic stability over static stability. Now, static stability is the first stability concepts that were developed in the 1900s. They were developed and they are sound very strong, it gave very good results and they were able to um, make the ships fairly safe and all that. But there are some conditions when you have very transient phenomena, very highly impulsive phenomena means re, uh, phenomena where the uh, phenomena where, where the some in this case let us say the wind acts not for a continuously, it is not a constant wind of uh, 10 knots acting continu acting in a steady form of over a let us say a day or two days. On the other hand, it is a very strong gust of wind when something like um, uh, 50 knots as we said or 20, 40 knots suddenly acting over a short range of time of let us say one hour. So, when you have such a gust of wind, it is not solvable using the statical stability concepts means it is not a static state, it is a very transient or highly dynamic state. Now, such a concept can only be studied using a dynamic stability concepts, which is what we mean by the dynamic stability curve, dynamical stability analysis. Remember that we said dynamical stability, we did the statical stability first, where the condition for stability was just that gm should be greater than 0. Now, that is true of course, in a statically steady state, the fact that gm should be greater than 0 holds for all ships which uh, needs to become stable in an upright condition, it holds. But to add to that, the fact is that this condition is just not enough. You need more variables, there are more variables and there are more conditions that need to be met, small, more criterion that needs to be met if uh, a ship has to be completely stable when it is subjected to a sudden transient dynamic phenomena like a gust of wind. So, um, so in this case we come up with the dynamical stability concepts, the main of which is the concept of dynamical stability and dynamical stability as I have defined is defined as the area under the GZ, uh, delta GZ 
phi curve delta into g z on one side on one axis and phi on the other side or the other axis. So, the area between this two curves is what we call as the dynamical stability curve. Uh, it, the area between this curve is known as the dynamical stability and dynamical stability if if you have clearly understood the concepts you will you will remember that dynamical stability actually involves the area that has been transferred into the ship because of a sudden now if a sudden gust of wind it doesn't matter whether it is um, a transient sudden phenomena an impulsive phenomena or if it is a constant steady uh, inflow of energy into the ship whatever it is it's finally a transfer of energy from the wind into the ship and the concept of dynamical stability always takes this concept concept into mind it accepts the um, it accepts the energy as um, uh, it accepts the energy into the ship it, that total energy is taken in and this energy is then expended into healing the ship and once the ship heals uh, we we calculate based on the amount of energy that has gone in how much the ship heals and then we say that if the ship heals to less than this particular uh, final heal then the ship is stable. Uh, this is the concept of stability and so, so here we go into the, uh, so we are going to deal with the concepts of dynamical stability and the formulas related to that, the, that are being laid out by the IMO. First is the ones that are uh, dealing with the wind concepts, we will go into wind. As I mentioned in the last class, the, the wind lever, note that this is the wind lever due to a uh, constant wind steady wind, wind lever is given by P A Z by 1000 G delta. This is how the IMO de defines the wind lever. Now here P represents the wind stress which is in case you are not familiar with hydrodynamics, stress is defined as the force per unit area um, in the tangential direction. Stress is always defined in a tangential direction and pressure is defined in a, in a normal direction. That is so, if you have a structure the or the fluid domain, uh, fluid and a structure, the force acting normally on the structure we call it as pr force per unit area acting normally on the structure we call it as pressure and the force acting tangentially on the surface per unit area we call it as stress. Now, due to this um, wind, due to this wind therefore, P in this equation is the um, is the wind stress which we put the maximum value we put it as about 540 Newton per meter square. A is the uh, sail area, sail area means it is the windage area, it is the amount of area in the um, in the ship which is subjected to the wind. So, when the ship comes like uh, with the, when the wind comes like this, if the ship is standing here, this area that is subjected that is subjected to the wind is what we call it as the windage area. So, and Z here represents the vertical distance between the centroid of the windage area and the half draft and I am sure you remember what I already explained. So, this distance is called as z, delta is the displacement. So, once you have these uh, quantities you can get the wind lever. Now, how do we calculate the wind gust? We say that the wind lever due to wind gust is about 1.5 times the wind lever due to a steady wind. It is just an average value. We that is it is something like a maximum value that is the maximum lever that can happen due to a uh, increase in the wind uh, and acting for a short time that lever is given by 1.5 times LW1. Now, we have a couple of formulas developed um, by the IMO for the, um, for the amount of healing that is allowed due to wind. Now, it is given by this formula where phi 1 is equal to 109 k x1, I will explain what each term is, root rs. This is the basic formula that is given for, this is the amount to which it can heal or it is the amount to which it will heal, sorry, not can heal, it will heal provided the wind is, I mean provided the ship is subjected to a wind, this is the amount, this represents the amount to which the ship will heal and 109 is a constant, k has some values depending upon the type of ship. For instance, k equals 1 for round bilge ships. Now, in case it is not familiar what is meant by bilge, we usually talk about the 
keel region of the ship that is the region exactly at the bottom you know that the keel is defined as the region at the bottommost part of the ship now that the structure of the ship along the keel is what we call as a bilge now if you have a round bilge as the name itself suggests if you have a round bilge we give the value of k as 1 k equal to 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.7 if the ship has sharp keel it means very abrupt or very sharp keel and k is um, it is it, this is how it is given in some table 3.2.2.3 of the code by code we mean the IMO code and in that code in that table it, there is a code there is a set of there is a booklet which will give you the entire set of code and in that there is a section that deals with the winds in that in that section that this table number will give you the uh, values of k for the different types of ships where you have ships with round keels bilge keels i mean uh, round bilged ke uh, round bilge or uh, sharp bilge etc so different types of um, keels are possible or different types of uh, bilges are possible Bil now so this is how k is man uh, measured then the next step is to get x1 x1 is measured using uh, before that uh, there is r i'll tell you what this r is this r is defined as 0 0.73 plus 0 0.6 g by tm this is the definition for r we'll go one by one so k we have defined so this is r r is defined as 0 0.7 now for those who are familiar with uh, scantling calculations and um, yeah mainly scantling calculations and like who are familiar with the construction of ship as such those who are familiar with the uh, when you are making a ship you make the scantlings and uh, you know you know the bulkheads and when you define those stiffeners when you define like you will see these kind of in that booklet that you deal with uh, these stiff uh, these uh, uh, keels and uh, uh, stiffeners and uh, uh, all these spacings and all that you will see that you will come up with such formulas these are commonly seen so r is equal to 0 0.73 plus 0 0.7 this is a formula for this this thing this r and here og represents the distance between the water line and the center of gravity the center of gravity so you have the center of gravity of the ship and the water line of the ship now the distance between the two will be given by OG here and TM in the equation represents the half draft uh, the full draft TM is the draft and um, uh, so once you have that you get the R value for the for this equation then um, now we have uh, usually you have also, also we have already mentioned that in case that a ship starts healing there is a uh, sometimes that dynamic process of healing where the ship moves to and fro is known as rolling means healing as a function of time or rather healing continuous like healing is a static phenomenon it heals like this and stays there that's called healing but if it is going to and fro like this that process we call it as rolling so it's slightly different it's a one of the six degrees of freedom like you know there are uh, six degrees of freedom means it can move like this like this like this it can roll like this like this like this so that produces six degrees of freedom we it's it's a part of the other different course like you will see it in the dynamics course ship dynamics course um, so these degrees of freedom produce the different types of motion one of which is the roll roll is this kind of motion it's a angular motion it's not really a displacement motion like this it's not like that it's a rolling motion now this rolling motion is uh, the time period of rolling is defined as c b by root g m effective so the effective g m of the ship um, this is the this is now we are going to explain that equation for dynamic but in the this comes in between there is the time period is given by 2 c where here b is the breadth of the ship we know what it is c is a constant that is given defined as
Now, this is a big equation. This is equation that tells you how to calculate C, which is a constant in this. You see this C. So, C is given by this expression 0.373, this thing, where here B is again the breadth of the ship, T m is the draft of the vessel, and L w L is the length between the water lines. Okay. So, you have this, you have this, you have this. It is just a constant depending upon all this, and uh, C B divided by gm effective. You know that gm effective is, men, is the metacentric height, the effective metacentric height of the ship and uh, how will it vary from the net gm of the ship or the initial gm of the ship? It will vary from the gm of the ship if for instance, if you have a free surface effect already defined, uh, what is a free surface effect? That is in case you have a liquid on the in a tank inside the vessel and if the tank is uh, not fully filled. So, in case the tank is fully filled, then there is no free surface effect, but in the case when the tank is not fully filled, but only partially filled, it will have a free surface and the free surface will tilt as the ship is healing and this in turn will produce a shift in the center of gravity of the ship and things vary and the gm. So, if the g shifts, obviously the gm changes and this produces a gm effective, which is different from the initial gm, gm initial or g m 0, it is not a g m 0, but it is g m initial. So, the this is g m effective. So, this will give you T, which is the um, now uh, the, the other co I'll, the. So, we are going back into this equation. So, in this equation, now we know what is um, k r. Now, we need to know x 1, x 2 and s. So, this is how to get phi 1 for in we will we'll see how it is done. We will have we have an example here. Okay. Now, in this in this problem here, you are told that uh, some sections have been slightly cut off, but okay. that is. Uh, so, you have you are given a ship with the following particulars. You are told that the length of the ship is 75.4 meters, it is meters, breadth is 11.9, the draft is 4.32 kg is given as 5 meters. You are given the sail area 175 meters square, z we have already defined it, distance between the centroid of the sail area and the um, midpoint of the draft, uh, the half draft point, it is given as 4.19 and the wind pressure is p equal to 50 Newton per meter square. So, this is a particular case this. So, the, you are given that these conditions hold and um, this same thing we are doing like you now have a let us suppose you are now in the classification society and uh, you are now given the problem that um, you have uh, to calculate whether the ship is ship will pass the test or not. And so, your idea is to become phi 1 which I have given here this phi 1 needs to be calculated. This phi 1 is the this one. Now, this phi 1 um, is to be calculated and so you need to get all these values k, k x 1 x 2 r s. So, once you have that you can calculate the next um, phi 1 of the ship. Okay. Now, let us see how they do it there. Uh, first of all, in such a problem you start with um, first of all you have to calculate L w 1. We have already seen the formula to calculate L w 1 p a z by 1000 g delta. So, this will give you L w 1 that is very straightforward. Then you s we say that the wind gust lever is defined as L w 2 it is equal to 1.5 L w 1 this is given. Then now you need to get k for the code get k you have to get k from the code. I have already given you two values of k depending upon the type of ship you decide what type what is the value of k. Okay. Now, um, now this that is once you are given the um, okay. now once you are given the bilge once you are given the type of bilge that is what is the um, length of the bilge bilge is the distance we have already said along the keel of the ship that is that is a keel of the ship you have the bilge. Once you are given the length of the keel and the breadth of the depth of the keel 
uh, depth of the bilge, length of the uh, I am talking about bar keel, it is a solid construct, solid uh, bar type of construction. It will have a length and a breadth and width. So, once you have the length and depth as le length and depth as a function of these two values of x1 are given in the code. Um, it is actually given in table, um, well actually that number is not here. Uh, one of the, I think it is 3.2.2.3 of the code. In this code you have the, in this table you are given the values of x1, you need the, uh, you need the length and depth and once you have that you get x1. It gives x1 as a function of the uh, length of the bar keel. Then um, you need, what you will need to do is, then you will need to calculate what is known as the block coefficient which we already derived in the beginning stages of this course, what is called as a block coefficient. So, this block coefficient is calculated, you know that block coefficient is defined as del divided by L B T, okay. del is the underwater volume of the ship, L is the length, breadth, B is the breadth and T is the draft. So, once you have that you will have to calculate del, uh, you will have to calculate C B, okay. you are given for this ship all these parameters are given. Now, once you have all this, you will need to calculate C B and you will see that when you look at the code, that booklet as a function of the C B, the block coefficient of the ship x 2 will be given. x 2 which is again a parameter here in this equation, we have this parameter x 2. So, this will be given as a function of C B, the block coefficient. So, once you have that, you will get x 2. So, this is how you get x 2. Then then of course, you need to calculate um, now, um, now as now the next step is to calculate this. Um, what did I say? Ah, this one. So, the next step once you do this, the next step is to calculate O G, okay. Uh, and the next step is to calculate the C, that is uh, using this formula you get C and once you have C and B and G M effective, you get T. Then you will see that in the code, in the, uh, it is a slightly different part of the code, table 3.2.2.34, this section of the code, this is all in the code booklet, okay, the code that deals with the um, uh, the, this is the code that deals with the uh, the uh, wind wind region or the wind statical stability uh, laws or the rules. So you take this region, this code, this table of the code. You will see that once you provide t, which is the time period of roll. Please remember, note what each thing is. It is the time period of roll, which you can which is a function of the hydrostatic particulars of the ship, it depends upon B, the breadth of the ship, it depends upon um, C, which also depends upon the length of the water line, it depends upon the, uh, the draft. So, it depends upon length, breadth and draft. So, that T one and it depends upon GM, that is the GM of the ship, the net GM or the effective GM. So, once you have that, you, so once you get the time period of roll, this one, so once you have this, then you go into this table, it will give you values of s as a function of uh, time period here. So, now this is the way, so now you have s, r you have already uh, given you the equation here, r is this, so we need to calculate o g next, o g is the distance between the water line and the center of gravity of the ship. So, provided you know the height k g, which is given as you have seen in this problems, k g is given. So, once you have the center of gravity of the ship and you can find the distance up to the water line and once you have that, you have the draft also, you can get R. So, once you have all this, all you need to do is put it in this equation phi 1 equals uh, this value that is 109 k x 1 x 2 root R s. They put it in this equation and then you will calculate the maximum. So, this gives you the maximum angle to which your ship will heal, phi 1 will give you the maximum angle to which your ship will heal. So, this value will have to be less than some prescribed values. For instance, 
it will depend upon the type of ship. So, IMO says that for particular types of ships, for instance, whether it is a tanker, cargo, bulk carrier, um, any type of ship um, or a cruise vessel. So, different types of ships will have different values of limits for 51, not very different, it is it's, um, uh, somewhere around 30 degrees, 35 degrees. So, you will have that limit for 51, it should not heal beyond that due to wind. So, this is the 51 and this is the uh, criterion that is usually followed by the different navies in uh, calculating the wind. This is one way of doing it. The real IMO, the whole series of uh, uh, wind, wind healing arm equations and the wind healing arm formula, we have actually done it somewhere in the middle of the course, uh, maybe around lecture uh, 17 or 18, it must be coming. Uh, you will have the uh, that wind healing arm, we have talked about the wind healing arm, that whole theory which you know that is the research part of it that how that um, um, how that uh, wind healing arm is really to be studied, how to see how much the wind will heal. So, this is roughly a this is a simple formula, this is a simple series of formulas that can uh, finally pre and using this you can uh, give some guidelines about the whether the ship will be stable or not, but this is what is followed by the IMO, this is what IMO has developed as such. Now, therefore, you find phi 1 the maximum angle and you check whether it is less than the allowed value which is given some fixed values uh, or if it is less than the angle of flooding, uh, angle of uh, uh, decade immersion. So, once you uh, see these, you, once you compare with these then you will decide whether the ship is uh, acceptable or not. So, this is the first thing that is weather criterion. Then um, we will go into the US Navy as, so these are related to the IMO, so the International Maritime Organization. Now, slight modifications have been made by the different other um, navies. Uh, So, uh, so the different navies like the US Navy and the um, UK Navy, they have developed their own set of codes which are slightly different from the, um, which are slightly different from the uh, IMO, they have adapted it for their own purposes and uh, for instance, one, some of them I will mention, some of the important points. For instance, uh, US Navy says that the wind healing arm is defined as LV is equal to 0 0.017 VW square uh, A L uh, cos square phi by 100 delta, 1000 delta. Now, uh, we can compare it with the formula that we have already given for the wind healing arm by the IMO. So, some terms have been replaced and uh, um, now, first thing you can know, you should know probably is that in the previous case, we had an expression called P or we had a variable called P which represented the wind stress, which is which we defined gave it a maximum value of about 540 Newton per meter square. That is the tangential stress per unit area, tangential force per unit area or the tangential stress which is acting on the, um, which is acting on the, uh, which is acting due to the uh, wind. So, that is P. Now, in this case, the P variable for by the US Navy, they have replaced that P variable with a VW squared, v, where v, VW is the velocity of wind. So, VW squared, uh, the logic behind this is that uh, always you will see that the, uh, when you go into meteorology, we will see that the wind stress can always be measured as a function of, not measured, actually the wind stress is directly proportional to the wind velocity squared, that is the shear stress or the wind shear stress is always proportional to V squared, V, v of wind squared, okay, this thing. So, if in fact, it is uh, tau is really equal to rho, um, the real definition of rho uh, tau is actually rho u1, this is slightly outside the purview of this course, but like tau is usually defined as rho u1, u2, where u1 and u2 are the turbulent wind velocities. We usually when you have wind, we define it as 
u is in this direction in the x direction u1 u2 is in the y direction and u3 is in the w direction wind stress is always due to the horizontal components of wind you you can know that the horizontal components of wind are u1 and u2 or which we call it as u and v w which is a vertical component of the wind doesn't really come into the calculation of wind stress wind stress therefore follows u and v which is u1 and u2 and uh, in general the wind stress is given as u1 u2 and this in general is written as so this is rho u1 u2 gives the wind stress where rho is the density of air u1 and u2 are its velocities in the turbulent velocities and this has been written as u star squared where u star is actually known as the uh, frictional velocity so u star is known as frictional velocity and this is written as this is roughly like this which in fact becomes something like rho cd u squared okay u is the net velocity of wind and uh, it's the real definition is u into modulus u but you can reduce it to uh, u into u you can put it as rho cd u square so what you see is that the wind stress is in general proportional to the velocity of wind squared so what the us navy has done is they have replaced the equation for p they have been replaced with the value for u square u w square and um, therefore the formula reduces changes slightly into this format l small l here this is okay then small l here represents the again the distance between the centroid of the windage area and the uh, the midship or uh, the mid not midship uh, the distance the centroid of the windage area to the mid draft okay the distance between the mid draft and the centroid of the water plane area is l so that is all right and phi is the angle through which it is healing and if it happens this is the this gives you the this is at any angle of heel which is away from 0 degrees if it is not 0 if it is 0 of course this term becomes 1 it is not there it is just this at any other value it becomes cos square phi so it gives you so this is a slight difference in there and here usually we talk about v w um, so here what we are saying as VW, I mean this is again a little bit out of hydrostatics, we are going slightly into um, fluid dynamics. So we have here VW, the wind velocity is usually talked about as a wind velocity at a height of, wind velocity at any height h, okay. We, um, VW in general this is given by the formula. This is again given by this uh, booklet for this code booklet for the US Navy. They write it like this. So this gives you an, this is VW represents the wind velocity at any particular height that is at any arbitrary height and V naught we have given there represents the wind velocity at a height of 10 meters. Now there are some criterion you will see there are some, there is some uh, rationale behind the, ax, uh, behind the taking of 10 meters because that is kind of taken as a rough value of the boundary layer thickness and uh, therefore the roughly the boundary layer height can be taken as 10 meters over the sea. Um, so that is why that 10 meters comes. So for instance whenever um, we talk about meteorology the they always when we are talking about sea surface height sea, when we are talking about the surface wind that is by surface wind we mean the wind that is blowing close to the surface whether it be the land or the ocean um, when we say surface wind it is actually measuring the wind at the height of 10 meters from the ground that is a standard normal practice it is always at 10 meters from the ground now that so this is the ratio this is the relation between wind at any particular height which is at different from 10 and this is at 10 meters now in the reason being that in general you will see that the wind profile is always like this if you consider this to be the ground the wind profile will always look like this so the wind profile in general will look like this 
as a function of this is the velocity of wind it will look at in this uh, as a function of height from the ground. So, at the ground immediately at the ground you will see that the wind velocity is 0 and slightly the wind velocity increases and uh, somewhere around 10 meters we define 10 meters at this height we define V 0 and V w is at any other height apart from 10 meters. So, this will give you um, uh, this will give you the um, V 0 and uh, this is the general profile of the wind in the boundary layer. In fact, this is not just the profile in the of the wind in a boundary layer, this is in general the profile of any uh, velocity, any horizontal velocity. If you look at the profile of the velocity in the um, boundary layer, it follows somewhat this pattern. It is again not directly in this course, but uh, you should know that the re what we mean by a boundary layer is um, it is a uh, this boundary layer is a result of a fluid structure interaction. What we mean by fluid structure interaction is when you have a fluid so a whether it is be whether it be the air or water when the fluid flows over a solid which is a any kind of solid in this case we are talking about ground and the air is flowing over ground. So, when there is an interaction between the fluid and the ground or between the um, air or the, in this case the air and the um, air and the ground or between water and a ship for instance there is always a region very close to the surface of the ship like this there is a region very close to the surface of the ship here like this if this is the ship uh, or if it is the ground in close to the ground this region where um, the process of viscosity is very important. and this region we call it as the boundary layer the b l represents the boundary layer it is a note that it is a very small region close to the body uh, in some cases not even more than a few uh, centimeters maybe 10 centimeters long uh, 10 centimeters thick that is the that is what we call as the boundary layer it is the region where the the it is a region the easiest way to define a boundary layer or the simplest way to define a boundary layer is one is where the viscosity is very important number one, but a real way of defining boundary layer is you say that these are regions where the velocity gradients are very large. By velocity gradients you know uh, you know that it means dou u by dou y or dou u by dou z means the velocity varying over the boundary layer is very large. The velocity variation over the boundary layer is very large and uh, that is the velocity varies like this fashion like you see here. For instance, this if you say that this is the whole region of boundary layer. So, if you say that this is the whole region of boundary layer, we say that this whole region in this whole region the velocity changes very <coughs> excuse me. So, the velocity changes very rapidly. So, the velocity changes very rapidly here. Um, it varies from a value absolutely minimum value at the ground and it increases to a maximum value and outside the boundary layer we call that region as free stream. It is outside the boundary layer and there the concepts of uh, boundary layer and there you hardly have any variation in velocity. So, this gradient in velocity is very small when you come to the free stream or what we call as the region outside the boundary layer. So, and the the, ter, the da, uh, fluid dynamics inside the boundary layer is much more complicated than what happens in the free stream because as you can imagine it is a case of free stream plus fluid structure interaction so fluid structure interaction produces a lot more complexity in the form of turbulence and um, boundary layer phenomena which affects the overall flow structure in that region so that's again out of the uh, subject it's not necessary here so 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 the american navy have the US Navy have defined their uh, the stability criteria for their ships based on all these criteria they have considered all this they have uh, developed a slightly se different set of laws that deal with the stability of the ships uh, as a function of this. Um, uh, now, it is a function of wind velocity and uh, not really stress and uh, they have talked about the variation with height and all that and finally, you get this slight variation 
So, US Navy varies the you see the slight variation from the what we call as the uh, I from what we said as the IMO criterion. So, that is the now um, and even the um, even the turning criterion um, ok. In the case of turning criterion there is not much of a difference we will see here what is the turning criterion right here it is given. This is the turning criterion by given by the US Navy. Now, it is imperative that it is very important that the angle of heel at any point during the turning does not exceed 15 degrees. So, when the ship is heeling we have already seen the expression for the turning moment and uh, the turning lever and the and because of this lever note we, we can uh, we have drawn um, as you remember we have already drawn curves between the curves for statical stability with the turning arm So, you have the curve of statical stability if you draw the this we will call it this is the L T this is the turning lever. So, this is the turning lever and um, um, so this is the uh, writing arm and this is the turning lever. Now, this region this area we call it as So, this region uh, in the um, in this curve this region we call it as a reserve of dynamic stability. Now, the criterion associated with the US Navy for turning are this the first criterion is that the at any rate you should not have the angle of heel greater than 15 degrees. So, that is fixed. Now, here looking at this figure we defined already that statical stability curve I believe sometime in the somewhere in the when we define this we also define what is known as the angle of static equilibrium. There we saw that the we defined that the angle where the curve of statical stability that is the G z curve the the point where the G z curve meets the uh, meets the healing arm curve. So, the G z is the writing arm curve and L is the healing arm curve the point where these two curves meet is what we call as phi s t which is the uh, angle of static stability. So, this is one point of phi s t we will call it phi s t 1 this is the second point of s phi s t which is phi s t 2. So, you have two angles of static equilibrium phi s t 1 and phi s t 2. Now, um, it is one, one important thing we so the second point of the the second point of this uh, US Navy criterion is that here you will see that the healing arm at the angle of static equilibrium is not larger than 0.6 the maximum writing arm value. So, whatever is the G z value at phi s t 1 ok what we call as G z value G z value the G z value at phi s t 1 should be um, less than or equal to 0 0.6 times G z maximum. So, whatever is the G z maximum that is the maximum writing arm for that particular ship for that particular G z curve of that ship. Note that every ship once it is def defined will have its own G z curve and um, once you define the G z curve of a ship um, you find out the maximum G z that will happen somewhere around uh, the middle of that or uh, it is somewhere around the middle usually from 0 to about 70 it will be around 40 degrees probably. So, you have the G z maximum and you have to find uh, the G z at the statical stability 1 point phi s t 1 that should always be less than 0 0.6 the maximum value that is an important criterion for turning that is an important criterion for the turning stability for according to US Navy. Now, uh, there is one point that uh, we would like I uh, would like to make here is about the phi s t 1 and phi s t 2. So, as you can see because of the shape of the curve and the 
shape of the two curves that is the gz curve and the uh, lever arm curve for instance the gz curve goes up and comes down like this lever arm curve comes like this you can see that they intersect at two points so we have phi st1 and phi st2 both are known as statical stability angles of statical stability both of them phi st1 and phi st2 both are angles of statical stability but there is a slight difference between the two because if you look at the first phi st1 look at look at this figure if you look at this phi first phi st1 you will see that if the ship heals more than this phi st1 here let's suppose that the ship has heel here what do you see you see that the the moment it has healed further the writing arm is more than the healing arm at this point writing arm is more than the healing arm you can see it directly from the figure I'm not saying anything uh, theoretical just just looking at this figure i am saying when um, this phi when you cross phi st1 you see that gz is greater than the healing arm so what does it mean if you have your writing arm greater than your healing arm that means immediately that the ship will try to come back to its original position therefore it is a case of stable equilibrium therefore what we talk about as phi st1 which is your first angle of statical stability is actually the first angle of statical stability is actually a, a, a stable um, stable angle of statical stability so the first angle is stable but now consider the second angle we are talking about the angle phi st2 here now if you look at this angle phi st2 if you look at this angle phi st2 it is a curve it you see that here suppose there is a further increase in heel the ship heels a little further after it reaches phi st2 it will go like this you see directly that gz is less than the healing arm you see here this is gz this is less than the healing arm this is the healing arm this is the gz gz is less than the healing arm this is healing arm so at the angle of second angle of uh, statical stability you have the healing arm is greater than the uh, gz so you see that the second that automatically means the ship has a tendency to heal further not to come back to its position therefore it is not a point of stable equilibrium it's a state of unstable equilibrium so you say that phi st2 is unstable equilibrium so your phi st1 is stable equilibrium phi st2 is unstable equilibrium so these are two angles of uh, static equilibrium that you have in a ship any ship will have these two and of course there can be more if you have angles of law and all that you can have more but uh, but if in a general ship you'll have two such uh, angles and one of them is stable the other is unstable so that is one criterion and as i've said before this area under this this area that is between that is actually outside the angle of lever uh, this lever arm this angle uh, this area is known as the reserve of dynamic stability reserve of dynamic stability and one rule of the us navy for this turning says that the reserve of dynamic stability is not less than 0.4 of the whole area under the writing arm curve so it's like this we say that um, the ratio between this curve which is a reserve of dynamic stability and the whole area so this let's call this one let's call this two so one by one plus two should be greater than 0.4 this is the meaning of the rule so if this is one which is the area two is this area this unshaded area so one by one plus two will be should be greater than 0.4 this is another criterion of the u.s navy for turning so these are some of the um, rules of the u.s navy uh, some of the criterion of the u.s navy then we will next go into the uk navy uh, since the time is up, I will stop here for today. We will continue tomorrow. Thank you.